Pamela Paul wrote a book in 2021 entitled 100 Things We Lost to the Internet. And she talks about things like the TV guide, the ability to memorize phone numbers, eye contact, attention span, and a host of other things that we just no longer have because of the advent of the internet. Some of those things are incidental, but some of them are rather disturbing. Her book is not really to say anything about the things that we've lost and how we can gain those things back. The fact is, she says, the times are changing. They haven't asked for our permission to change. The times have just decided to change. And when you think about all of the change that's taken place in our world, religiously and socially and politically, isn't it great to be able to serve a God who never changes? Amen. Malachi 3 and verse 6, he says, I'm the Lord your God, I change not, therefore you sons of Jacob are not consumed. Hebrews 13, 8 says about Jesus, he's the same yesterday, today, and forever. God does not change, he remains the same, and it's because God is timeless and unchanging that we can have a confidence in his unchanging and steadfast word. The psalmist says in Psalm 119 and verse 89, forever his word is settled in the heavens. His law, his word, it's perfect. Psalm 19 and verse 7. And because it is, it doesn't need to be changed or updated no matter the times in which we live. Proverbs 35 and verse 6. Every word of God proves true. We shouldn't add to it or take away from it. God's word is perfect just as he's given it to us. We don't get to decide the times in which we live. God has placed us in the times in which we're most needed to do his work and to be the people who ultimately will glorify and please him. And so we do desire in vain for former times or for better times the times that we need to live in and glorify God are right now when we think about the Bible when we think about the Word of God we should appreciate that it in its entirety is helpful and God breathed and uplifting and corrective and profitable second Timothy 3 16 and 17 and we live by every word of it but there are also certain verses of Scripture that contain certain principles that are just timeless truths we need every word from God. We don't get to sort of cherry pick the verses that we're going to obey and the others that we'll discard. But there is a time to take certain passages that are timeless truths and say, this is a passage or these are a group of passages that we want to take, ingest and apply to our lives. And so it is with the passage that's going to be underscored in this lesson. Leviticus eleven forty four. 44. God says to the people through Moses, be you holy for I am holy. And though that verse may be familiar to us, it appears in the Old Testament and in the New Testament, we do need to sit down with those words again and allow them to penetrate our hearts and shape us and ask certain questions. What does it mean to be holy? And what does it mean to be holy like God is holy? And can that be done? The biblical record says not only can it be done, it must be done. You know, if I would have known they were going to have that up there the whole time, I would have brought a PowerPoint. But you're just going to have to look at me twice, I guess. There we go. Ch changing times all the time. What we want to do in this lesson is make five moves in the text to show what does the Bible mean when it discusses biblical holiness? What does it mean to be holy like God is holy? What does God have to say to Christians about holiness in the New Testament and ultimately culminate with the Son of God most holy? And then the lesson will be yours. The first, number one. Turn your Bible to Isaiah chapter 6. If we would appreciate the Bible's statement on being holy as God is holy, the first thing that you and I must appreciate is the staggering holiness of God. The first time that the word holy appears in the Bible is talking about God. It's attributed to God. Genesis chapter 2 and verse 3. And that's for good reason because he is holy. Isaiah 43 and verse 15, the Bible says that he's the Lord God, the Holy One, the creator of Israel, your king. And we get an amazing picture into that. In Isaiah chapter 6, in the year that King Uzziah died, he saw the Lord sitting in his temple high and lifted up and exalted. And he saw these heavenly creatures known as the seraphim that had six wings. With two, they covered their faces. With two, they covered their feet. And with two, they did fly. And they cried out, Isaiah 6 and verse 3, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. Somebody has made the observation, and rightfully so, that the Bible nowhere says that God is love, love, love. The Bible nowhere says that God is grace, grace, grace. The Bible nowhere says that God is forgiving, forgiving, forgiving. Though he's all of those things, the Bible does say God is holy, holy, 
holy. These same words are echoed in Revelation chapter 4 and verse 8. This three times mentioning of holy is the superlative cry. It is to say God is not just holy, but he is extremely holy, holy, and holy. When the word is applied to God in the biblical text, whether the Old or New Testament, the idea is that God is separate. God is high. God is exalted. God is above all that which he has made and his righteousness and his purity cannot be tainted. And so Isaiah in verse five had the response that every one of us would have or should have if we were in his same shoes. And so in verse five, he says, woe is me. I'm undone. I'm a man of unclean lips. And I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. When he looked at his life, in relation to the holiness of God, he knew that he paled in comparison. The first thing to appreciate about holiness in the biblical text is the staggering holiness of God. The Bible doesn't just tell us that God is holy, though. The Bible says, especially throughout the Old Testament, that everything or every individual that God comes into contact with, that individual or that thing is also holy. And so one day in Exodus chapter 3, Moses is keeping his father's sheep on the west side. He comes to the west side of the mountain of Horeb. And I don't know how many times he probably had passed that patch of ground before, but on this day, there is a bush that is burning and it would not be consumed. And there's a voice that speaks from the bush, which identifies itself as the God of the patriarchs, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. But in Exodus chapter three and verse five, the voice speaks from the bush to Moses and says, take off your shoes, don't draw near, take your sandals off your feet for the ground on which you stand is holy ground. God was saying to Moses, don't approach, don't come too close, because I am holy. A few decades later, Joshua would have a similar experience. In Joshua chapter 5 and verse 15, he too would be told, take off your sandals because the place on which you stand is holy ground. Don't you see the pattern? Everything that comes into contact with God or that comes into his presence is described as holy. But it's not just the ground. It could be a day. Genesis 2 and verse 3 the Israelites will later be told in Exodus 27 through 11, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. What's holy about the day? It's associated with God. When they would construct the tabernacle, Exodus 40 and verse 9, it's the holy tabernacle. What makes it holy? God's presence is there. When Aaron and his sons, Nadab, Abihu, Ithamar, and Eleazar were to wear the garments that are prepared for them, Exodus 28 and verse 2 describes them as the holy garments that the priests would wear. I've set my king on his holy hill in Zion, Psalm 2 and verse 6. The Lord is in his holy temple, Psalm 11 and verse 4. God is so holy that even the promises that drip from his lips are described as holy. Psalm 105 and verse 42 describes them as the holy promises made to Abraham. The pervasive holiness of God in scripture is of such character that everything that comes into contact with him is holy. And it can't be otherwise. When the high priest would go into the tabernacle in the innermost part on one day a year, Yom Kippur, to offer up sacrifices first for his own sin and then for the people, the place to which he entered is sometimes called the most holy place or the holies of holy. Exodus 26 and verse 34, the feast days that Israel were to keep are holy convocations. Leviticus 23 and verse 2 and the entire nation of Israel is described this way. A holy nation, a royal priesthood. Are those words familiar? They're initially from Exodus 19, 5 and 6 to describe the nation of Israel. They're to be holy. You see, before we can move on to Leviticus eleven forty four and say anything about our need to be holy like God, we must first pause and see that before we can view holiness from the standpoint of imitation, we first must view it from the standpoint of admiration that God is holy and we on our own are not. That God is high and exalted and lifted up. And we dare not just rush into his presence in an unholy fashion. We sing a song. You are beautiful beyond description, too marvelous for words, too wonderful for comprehension like nothing ever seen in her. I stand, I stand in all of you. Holy God to whom all praises do. I stand in all. But here's the question. Do we? Are we really awed by his holiness? Job thought he wanted to see God until he did. 
Listen, what shocked Job and what all Job was not the divine SAT test that he couldn't pass. When God blitzed him with those questions in Job 38 through 42, Job says in Job 42, 4 to 6, I've heard of you, but now I've seen you and I repent in dust and ashes. The brightness of God's appearance, the manifestation that Job saw when God appeared to him in the whirlwind, the holiness staggered his mind and it should ours as well. God is holy, pure and righteous. Isaiah's experience is one that we all need to have. You know, the way that God refers to himself most often in the book of Isaiah is as the Holy One of Israel. Isaiah 41 and verse 20, Isaiah 43 and verse 15, Isaiah 47 and verse 4, the Holy One of Israel. And often in the book of Isaiah, when this is done, it's done as a contrast to the idols. And God is saying, I'm the Holy One of Israel, not those things that you've merely made with your own hands. And we shouldn't miss the point. That when people are struggling with putting things before God, the attribute of God that he raises to the surface is his holiness. God says, I am not going to come into a tie with anything else that wants to reign in your heart in the place that should be mine and mine alone. It's the holiness of God that we need to emphasize to draw people to a greater faithfulness and dependence of almighty God. He's the holy one of Israel. And that's how we should see him. You see, the first thing about holiness that you and I need to appreciate is the amazing and staggering holiness of God. It has a twofold effect. It's both attractive and dangerous. We see God's holiness and we say we want some of that. And the first thing God says is just not so fast. I don't know if you go to your grandma's house or somebody's house who's just had their carpet cleaned and you show up and they say, you got to dust those shoes off or maybe even take those shoes off your feet. Why do they say that? They don't want you tracking dirt into their house. When God tells Moses and Joshua, take your shoes off your feet, he doesn't want them tracking sin into his presence. You won't defy my presence because I'm a holy God. But the Bible doesn't just tell us that God is holy to astound us, but it also says it to challenge us so that in his holiness, we will be challenged to become like what we were always meant to be. Like God himself, Genesis 1, 26 and 27. The first thing about the holiness of God to appreciate is the staggering nature of it. Now, here's number two. Let's see holiness in context. If you have your Bible, go ahead and turn it to Leviticus chapter 11. The first thing about being holy like God is holy is to appreciate the staggering holiness of God. But then number two, we need to see our passage in his context. The passage that's been assigned is Leviticus 11:44, but there couldn't have been a host of passages mentioned from the book of Leviticus that emphasize this theme because Leviticus 11:44 is not the only place where Moses mentions this phrase or its equivalent, be holy like God is holy. Moses mentions that phrase or its equivalent some six times in these 27 chapters. Notice them, mark them. Leviticus 11:44, he says, be holy for I am holy in contrast to don't eat the creeping things and don't defile yourself in contrast to the dietary restrictions that God has laid down. But then it appears again in the next verse. Leviticus eleven forty five. 45, he says, be holy for I am holy. But this time the emphasis is on the idea that God had led them out of Egypt and ransomed them. Turn to Leviticus chapter 19 and notice verse 2. Leviticus 19 and verse 2, right before God gives Israel their conduct for holy living, he emphasizes this point, Leviticus 19, 2, be holy for I am holy. In Leviticus chapter 20, after he warns them in verse 6, no one should seek out mediums or magicians because that's a curse. He mentions in verse 7, the reason why that must not be done is because I am holy and you're to be holy just like me. Leviticus chapter 20 and verse 26, do not defile yourselves, do not corrupt yourselves, be holy for I am holy. And then for the final time in Leviticus 21, In a long chapter where he talks about the priest and their need to consecrate themselves, he says the priest can't marry a woman who's been divorced. He's the one that offers up the worship to God. He offers up the bread, Leviticus 21 and verse 8, and you're to be holy, Israel, because I'm holy. You see, Leviticus is a book that many Christians would be content to just sort of skip over, right? Somebody says, I want to read through my Bible. You get through Genesis, exciting stories about the patriarchs. You get through Exodus, there are the plagues. You kind of drudge your way through the tabernacle descriptions. And then you get to the book of Leviticus and you say, well, I just jump over to Matthew. (laughs) No Jew would have done that. 
It may very well be the most important book in the Hebrew Bible when the Jews think about how they were going to worship and approach God. The holiness of God is something that the Jews knew if they were going to be pleasing to God and acceptable to him. They had to get their hands around this concept. And so God says, you're going to be holy like I'm holy. And the reason for this is Israel's surrounded by two big issues. They just come out of Egypt. And God says, listen, you better not pick up the concepts and the idolatry that you were embracing in Egypt. And they already start to do this in Exodus 32. God says, don't do it. And you're going into the land of Canaan where they worship idols and practice child sacrifice. And I want you to be different. I want you to be distinct. I want you to be holy. When the word appears in the Bible and it talks to God's people, the word holy means to be separate or set apart. But it doesn't just mean that. It's more specific. It means to be set apart for God's special and unique purposes. And God wanted his people to be holy for that reason. Be set apart, be in a different camp, be in a different group. Does that sound familiar to you? If you're going to be my people, you need to be different. You can't be like Israel. You can't be like Egypt. You can't be like Canaan. You've got to be like me. And so sometimes people read about the dietary restrictions in the book of Leviticus or the grooming laws that are present there or the various things about their clothing. And somebody says, well, maybe God did it so that they would be healthy. If anything, that's peripheral at best. But God ultimately gives every law in the book of Leviticus because he wanted those individuals to be holy, to be different, to be set apart. In the book of Leviticus, they've got holy garments that they're supposed to wear. There are laws about their holiness as they give birth to their children, Leviticus chapter 12. There are laws on holiness for contact that they make with other individuals, Leviticus 15. There's an entire day devoted to holiness in Leviticus 16, the day of atonement. And all of this is given by God so that his people will be separate and distinct and that they won't just blend in and go with the crowd so that they might be the people that he's called them to be in holiness and in distinctiveness. Israel was not to be like the Canaanites. They were to be God's special and unique people in a land that was so contrary to them. Their dietary restrictions were going to be different. The law that they followed, that God had given them, was going to make them different, and they were going to be changed. When we grasp this concept, passages in the book of Leviticus that are familiar to us pop like they never have before. We think about Nadab and Abihu in Leviticus 10, 1 and 2, and somebody says, why were those boys killed? Well, they offered up strange sacrifice or strange or unauthorized fire, which the Lord commanded them not, Leviticus 10 and verse 2, and that's right, but that's not the whole story. When God gives divine commentary on the incident, he says in the next verse, in Leviticus 10 and verse 3, the reason why they died is because I will be sanctified that those that, by those that draw near to me, and I will be glorified among the people. God says they died, yes, for unauthorized worship, but don't you see unauthorized worship is more than missing a mere technicality. It's to diminish the holiness of God, and God says I won't stand for it. When Jesus says the greatest command, the second greatest command in the law is to love your neighbor as yourself, he quotes Leviticus 19, 18. But when we see it in the context of a book on holiness, we realize that the second greatest command is not so much about just being nice to your neighbors. That statement that Jesus quotes in Leviticus 19 is found in a chapter with this leading statement, Leviticus 19, 2, be holy for I am holy. What Jesus is driving at is this, because God is holy. You're to love image bearers the way that he's told you to because you want to be like him. When we read about the sacrifices, whether it was doves or bulls or goats in the book of Leviticus, the purity that's to be depicted in every sacrifice that Israel offered is to be borne by this idea that what they were to offer to God was to be holy. Turn your Bible to Leviticus 19. You see, the holiness of God in the book of Leviticus is not merely something that was God's secret with his people. Holiness is not merely even about what we don't do, though that's involved. Holiness is also on the offense. It goes out and it engages the world in which it is surrounded by. And so in Leviticus 19, God says in verse 2, you're to be holy for I'm holy. What does that look like? You're to make sure you offer up the right sacrifices and get your worship right. Leviticus 19, 4 through 8. God says, I don't want you to mistreat other people. I don't want you to mistreat the poor. Leviticus 19, 9 and 10. He says, I don't want you to lie or be mean to those that surround you and make sure that you take care of the foreigner and the stranger. Leviticus 19, 11 and 12. Make sure that you don't become a talebearer or a gossip. Don't mistreat the handicapped individual. 
Be a person that stands up for justice and what's right. Leviticus 19, 13 through 16. Don't hate one another. Leviticus 19 and verse 17. And above all else, love your neighbor like you love yourself. Leviticus 19, 18. Listen, there is no great commission in the old covenant. There is no go into all the world and make everybody a Jewish proselyte. But if Israel was to practice the holiness that God had them to, the nations wouldn't be able to help themselves. They would be drawn to God. And so Isaiah 49, 6, probably where Jesus gets this idea, Matthew 5, 16, Israel was to let their light so shine so that the salvation of God would be known among the nations if they were to be holy like God is holy. The holiness of God means that we appreciate the staggering holiness that is his to see this passage in his context. And then thirdly, to see holiness as it relates to New Testament Christians. The handwriting of ordinances, which was against us, was nailed to the cross but the command to be holy was not. God still demands that his people be holy. If someone were to say to you, what book in the New Testament most mirrors the book of Leviticus? What, what book of the New Testament would you say? Somebody says the book of Hebrews. And I would say potentially the book of Hebrews does the best job in the New Testament of explaining what the sacrifices under the old covenant were all about. But the book in the New Testament that most mirrors what we find in description and in process in the book of Leviticus is the book of 1 Peter. Turn your Bible to 1 Peter chapter 1. The third thing about being holy like God is holy is to see what God says about holiness for Christians. Peter begins this book in 1 Peter chapter 1 and verse 1 by saying he's writing to individuals that he describes as strangers and exiles and sojourners. They're from out of town. They're from Galatia and Cappadocia, Asia, Bithynia. He says, you're not from here. And you're to live like God wants you to. They're the elect of God, 1 Peter 1 and verse 2. But that comes with rich blessings and also responsibility. And so he tells them in 1 Peter 1, 15 and 16. You be holy in all your conduct, for it is written, be holy, for I am holy. You see, Peter quotes from the book of Leviticus, but he says it's on different terms now. Israel was in the wilderness and they were trying to get to the promised land. And God told them to be holy individuals. And when they were to arrive in Canaan, don't be like the Canaanites. And Peter says, you too are in a wilderness. You're in exile. You're a sojourner. And you make sure you live a holy life. He starts in verse 13 by saying, gird up the loins of your mind and be sober and hope to the end for the grace that's to be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ as obedient children. Not fashioning yourselves according to the form of lust and your ignorance, but as he who has called you is holy. You be holy in all your conduct. What does holiness mean to people in the book of first Peter? It means the very same thing, though, in a different covenant that it meant to the Israelites in the book of Leviticus. Moses says in the book of Leviticus, if you're going to be God's person, you don't get to eat what you want. God has dietary restrictions for you. Peter says, if you're going to be a Christian, if you're going to be holy, God has dietary restrictions for you. And so first Peter two and verse two, as newborn babes desire the sincere milk of the word that you may grow thereby. You're going to eat different stuff. You won't be like everybody else in the world. You're going to be different. How are you going to interact with other people? First Peter two, 11 through 12, he says, dearly beloved. Abstain from fleshly lust, which war against the soul, having your conversation honest among the Gentiles, that whereas they speak evil of your good works, they may by your good conduct, which they will behold, glorify God in the day of visitation. You're going to be different. And what about your government that may not see things the way that you see it? First Peter 2, 13 through 16. You're going to be holy because you're going to honor the people and the institutions which God has put in place. You're going to be different. And what about on your jobs and the way that you work and the way you interact with people? First Peter 2, 18 through 25, he says, servants, you're going to submit to your masters. And when people mistreat you, you're not going to respond back in kind because Jesus, when he was suffering, he threatened not. When he was reviled, reviled not again, committed himself to the one that judges righteously to be holy like he is holy, says you're going to do it different. And what about your home? How are you going to live? Well, if you're married to a man who's a non-Christian or a Christian who's not behaving like a Christian, Peter just says the man doesn't obey the word. He doesn't say he's a non-Christian. He may be a Christian who's not on his best behavior. If any obey not the word, how does she win him over? She's going to live a holy life, meet conversation, coupled with fear. First Peter three, one through six. And what about husbands? First Peter three and verse seven. Dwell with your wives according to knowledge. Given honor to her as the weaker vessel, being heirs together of the grace of life. What about treating one another properly? First Peter three and verse eight. Be kind and courteous and even our enemies. First Peter three and verse nine. Peter says, be holy like God is holy. You're different. We're different. We're God's people. 
How can you tell if somebody is from out of town? You normally can tell by the way they talk. I just moved to Kentucky, and I can tell. They can tell. I'm from out of town. <laughs> you sometimes can tell by what they wear. They don't dress like everybody else. There's a different dress about them. Normally, a person from out of town, when they get to a place, especially if it's a big city, they're kind of looking around. And you might say to a person, are you lost? Are you from around here? You seem to be sort of trying to find your way. And you can sometimes tell it even by the way that they walk. The Bible says, Christians, you're from out of town. You talk different. Some people can have their speech seasoned with grace some of the time, but you're from out of town. Your speech is always with grace. Colossians 4 and verse 6, that's the difference. We talk differently. We wear different things. We've put on Christ in baptism, Galatians 3, 26 and 27, and we're clothed in the armor of God, Ephesians 6, 10 through 17. We're different. We wear different things. We look around. We don't look up in despair, but since we've been raised with Christ, we seek those things which are above, setting our mind not on things of the earth, but things above. We've died. Our life is hid with Christ and God. We're looking heavenward, and we walk different. If we live in the Spirit, let us walk in the Spirit. Galatians 5 and verse 26, we are individuals that Peter describes as exiles, and we're to be holy like God is holy. In our country, our culture right now, the bar is so low. I mean, if we just caught a little bit of this, we'd be far above the masses. If we would just put a little bit of what Peter says into practice and live the holy lives that God would have us to, we far outdo our world and be people that would ultimately glorify God because holiness doesn't take the temperature of the world and say, well, at least we're doing better than them. Holiness says, I ultimately want to be like God. You know, a strange thing happened in our world in 2020. The Gallup poll did a survey. They took 118 countries and they surveyed them all and they figured, you know what? It's a good idea to wash your hands. You probably should do that. They surveyed all of these countries and they found that many people said at least in 2020 for the first time they were washing their hands five times a day. I wonder what was going on before that. If you spend any time in airports, you see people. They go right into the bathroom. They just come right out, sitting right next to you on the plane, passing you pretzels and peanuts, you know, and you're thinking, this guy didn't even watch. You say, disgusting. But there's something worse. It's being a Christian, being a member of the church, singing songs, memorizing verses, attending lectureships and really not being changed, really not being holy people. We can become people that love to study about God and not people that love to behave like God. We can get into a habit of just learning how to be professional Christians and going through the motions, but the New Testament calls us to a higher standard. The New Testament says holy living means in a world of harshness, you be gentle, Galatians 5, and 23. We can be firm and gentle without becoming obnoxious. It says in a world of moral relativism, you be an individual that says, we know the truth, we hold to the truth, and we won't compromise it, John 8, 31 and 32. Holiness says in a world of prejudice, you refuse to practice partiality, James 2 and verse 1, you be different. In a world that's so focused on covetousness and greed, holiness says you give of your means, you share with other people, Acts 20 and verse 35, you be different. Because God's called you to be different. You live a life that's set apart, that's distinct, because God's called you to do it. Here's the question for us. Do people know that we're from out of town? I suppose if you were to go into Canaan, ancient Near East, Old Testament times, you could spot an Israelite a mile away. His beard's different, his cut different. He wears different things. When he goes to the market, he's going to order different food. He just doesn't look like the people from Canaan. And if you were to transport him back to Egypt, he would just be different. He would be distinct. They might even say that he was weird. He's from out of town. God says, you're different. It's interesting to me that the command from Moses in Leviticus 11:44 is given in the wilderness. I wonder why that's the case. Because the time to get this right, the time to focus on being the person that God would have you to be is in the wilderness and not in the promised land. It'll be too late then. And so Peter says the time to be the holy people of God is right now as we're exiles, is right now as we're sojourners, because when we finally get to the promised land, it'll be too late then. Here's number four. There is the spiritual inheritance of the holy. Would you look at first Peter chapter one and notice verses three through five? Peter says, blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, 
who's begotten us again to a living hope by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, to an inheritance, notice this terminology, incorruptible, undefiled, that fades not away. That sounds like a holy place. Incorruptible, undefiled, that fades not away, reserved in heaven for you who are kept by the power of God through faith unto salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time. The fourth thing we need to appreciate about being holy like God is holy is this, for those that do that, there is a spiritual inheritance that awaits in heaven with God. Why is that important? Because so many people view holiness as drudgery. They think about if I'm holy, that's going to take all the fun out of life. But the New Testament says for those that are holy, for those that practice holiness the way that God would have us to do it in the end, there's a great blessing that awaits. And that's holiness with God in heaven for all eternity. Philippians 3, 20 and 21 says our citizenship is in heaven. And from there also we look for our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will change our lowly body, that it might be fashioned like his glorious body according to the working by which he's able to subdue all things to himself. We will be heaven-bound people if we're holy as we live now. If, if we're the people that God would have us to be on this earth, we'll go to be with God there in that land then. But we've got to get the holiness right now. Holiness, is, according to God, doesn't mean sinfulness. We need to get this right. Somebody says, well, this sounds like too high of a standard. The Israelites were to practice holiness so that they wouldn't contaminate their fellowship with God. The good news for Christians is this. The same blood of Jesus that cleanses us at baptism continues to cleanse us as we walk in the light. John says in 1 John 1, 5 and 6, we can't have fellowship with God while we walk in darkness. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we do enjoy fellowship and the blood cleanses us from all our sins. Now, what does walking in the light mean? Somebody says it means doing your best to live for God. And that's probably right. It means doing your best to live according to Christian principles. That's probably right. But in first John, in the context of first John one, seven through 10, one of the things that John says it means to walk in the light, it means to be honest about your sins. He says, if you say you don't have any, if you say that you haven't sinned, you lie and that lie puts you in darkness. And at that point, your fellowship is broken off with God. And so true holiness is not merely about straining and being perfect people, though we need to be holy and pure. It's about realizing all that we cannot be without God's help. Amen. It's about the fact that we need God to help us through to be the people that God would ultimately have us to be. And when we do that, when we're holy like he is holy and realize our dependence, Peter says there's an inheritance that's incorruptible. It's undefiled. It's unfading and it's reserved in heaven for you. The motivation for holy living is ultimately to dwell with God for all eternity and be where he would have us to be. The football team, the New Orleans Saints, they got their name in 1966 when the team was established. And part of the reason for that is November 1st, 1966, the day that the New Orleans Saints became a football team is also known in the Catholic faith as All Saints Day. A day when the Catholics honor who they would consider to be these venerated saints, whether past or future. But you know, in the New Testament, one of the New Testament, the Holy Spirit's favorite ways to refer to the people of God is as the saints or the holy ones. Acts 9, 13, Ananias said, I've, I've heard what Saul has done to your saints in Jerusalem. Romans 1 and verse 7, to those loved by God and those that are saints, sometimes we let the world hijack biblical terminology and we cease to use it, lest we be like them. But the ultimate goal in the New Testament is to take God's words and use them as God's people and then live like him. We are the saints. We are the holy ones. And if we are holy, the saints will go marching in, ultimately with God for all eternity. Now, here's the fifth and final thing about holiness that we need to appreciate, and it is Jesus, the Son of God, most holy. And all our attempts to be holy, we ultimately fail in comparison when we compare ourselves to Jesus Christ. You probably do a little bit better than people in the congregation where you worship, and if you compared yourself to them, you feel pretty good but they're not the standard. Ultimately, Jesus Christ is the standard of holiness. He was called holy before he was ever born. Luke 1, Mary would conceive a son of the Holy Spirit and he would be called the Holy One or the Holy Thing. When the apostles were persecuted and they prayed in Acts chapter four, Peter says in Acts 4.30, they've done things to your holy child, Jesus. He's holy, harmless, undefiled, separate from sinners, made higher than the heavens. Hebrews 7 and verse 26, he's the ultimate standard of holiness. And when you view Jesus in that light, it makes sense that those that will follow in his footsteps would likewise be holy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. And Jesus spent his entire ministry trying to raise the bar of people's expectations of what it meant to be God's disciple to say, 
This is ultimately the standard. And so whether it was anger in the Sermon on the Mount, he says, listen, be careful with that anger because ultimate holiness means that you keep your anger in check so you won't eventually commit murder and violate God's law. Matthew 5, 21 through 26. Jesus would challenge people and say, check that lust. It's not just about refraining from committing the act of adultery. It's keeping yourself from the very thoughts that lead to such. Matthew 5, 27 and 28. Keep your word. Be a person of integrity. Remember the vows you made. That'll keep you from flippant divorce and getting out of arrangements you've made with God and other people. Matthew 5, 31 through 36. Look to the benevolent God and it'll help you and it'll shape you to treat people that are made in his image the right way, whether they're faithful or unfaithful, because God is that same way. Matthew 5, 43 through 48. And so Jesus could say, it's not that which goes into a man that defiles a man, it's what goes out of his body. For out of the heart, Proceed evil thoughts, murder, adulteries, fornication, false witness, and blasphemies. These are the things that defile a man. But to eat with unwashed hands, that ultimately doesn't defile anyone. Jesus, the Son of God, most holy, is described, and he's the only person in the history of the world that could say these words. I always do the things which please my Father, John 8, 29. The wicked one has nothing in me, John 14 and verse 30. He's the only person who could ever say those words. And he was treated as unholy. He was treated as an enemy so that we as enemies of God who lived unholy lives could ultimately be received by God and accepted. And the words that are said about Jesus can then be attributed to us. Here is my son or my daughter and whom I'm well pleased. The words from Leviticus 11:44 echoed in 1 Peter for our good, for our admonition, and they're ultimately a challenge. For the Christian, God is the standard, and we're to be holy like he is holy, no matter when we live, no matter where we find ourselves. And that is a timeless truth that we must not cut ourselves off from. Thank you for your attention this morning.